Hello, and thank you for joining me in this workshop where we're going to talk about how to manage all those books. If you are using a literature-based curriculum, you will quickly find out that, that your book collection will grow each year that you're homeschooling, and it will grow quite quickly, kind of like dust bunnies. Um, I'd like to go ahead and introduce myself before we get started. My name is Sheila Del Charco and I homeschooled three kids. Uh, my oldest, we homeschooled through ninth grade and then he went to a private Christian school and the other two we homeschooled all the way through. The oldest two are graduated from college and are working and the youngest one is still in nursing school. So I am a veteran homeschool mom. I am no longer homeschooling, but I am here to share all the tips and tricks of the things that I've learned over all the years of homeschooling. So as I said, what are you going to do with all of the books that you receive? It's a literature-based curriculum. You're gonna get books and books need to have a place to live. Where do books live? On bookshelves, that's right. So I recommend trying to invest in the tallest, bookshelves that will fit in your space. Obviously, you don't want to block a window. So if you don't have a, a blank wall space where you can put a set of bookshelves and you, you know, you can get lower ones. But if you have an empty wall or you can move furniture around so that you can put tall bookcases on a wall that doesn't have windows, I would recommend using that vertical space. Um, get the tallest ones that you can find or fit into your home in order to maximize that vertical storage space. And then once you have your bookshelves in place, I like to organize my bookshelves by level and each level by subject. So let's say you are starting out and this is your very first year and you have a kindergartner. And so you buy the all subjects package K from Sunlight. And so you're going to get one, possibly two large boxes full of books. So you're gonna have your, your bookshelf and I like to organize all my K books on one shelf. If you have more books than will fit on your shelf, then try and fit all of one subject. So all of the history Bible literature live together. And I even divide it by history, literature, and Bible or Bible, history, literature, however you want to organize it. And then I also like to organize them by height. So some people will organize them by the week that the book comes out, but I find that's messy. It's a, it's a little, a little bumpy in there if you do it that way. But so a shelf with history, Bible literature, and then maybe another shelf, if not, if it won't all fit on one shelf, you can put your science, math, language arts, um, handwriting, any of the other subjects that won't fit on the history Bible literature shelf. And again, then those get organized together. So all the science books go together, all the math books go together, all the language arts workbooks, if you're doing in any of those optional books. So those all go together. And then I like to keep a shelf um, without any of the, of the back stock, if you will, I call that my working shelf. So on that shelf, that's where the instructor's guide goes, the current books that we are reading from. So the history spine, the science spine, the current read aloud, the current reader, the, the math workbooks, the language arts workbooks, if you have them, um, whatever you are currently using lives on the working shelf. That way you're not you know, losing things on the main shelf space. After you have finished a book, so let's say you complete a read aloud in the History Bible at K, then that read aloud will go on the regular shelf and you'll look for whatever your next read aloud is. And then you'll pull that and it'll go on the working shelf. Another idea, if you don't have the shelf space, is to use a piece of furniture. We used to have a five drawer uh, dresser that I allocated as our school dresser. 
and I have three children. So each child got a drawer. The youngest one got the bottom drawer. The next one got the next one. And then the older child got the taller drawer. And then I got a drawer. And then we had a school supply drawer. So a five drawer dresser is another idea. And each child would put their books in their drawer. And in my drawer, I kept the history spine, science spine, instructor's guide, things like that. The other thing I did, which is just a little hack, is I would not use, not I would not carry the big binder around with me. I would have a half inch binder and I would pull out the weeks that we were working on. So let's say we're on week three. I would pull out all the pages that are behind the week three tab in the big binder and put them in my working binder. I have a working shelf. I have a working binder. And that's the binder that we would work from, that I would work from. So all my pages, the history Bible lit schedule pages, the language arts pages, and the science pages with all the worksheets would go in the working binder. And then I had something much more manageable to carry around with me. So I could pop it open, take out the activity sheets when the kids needed theirs. It was right there. I had all the study guides for the readers and read alouds, and I could check things off as we were going. It was very, very easy to carry around and use. At the end of the week, Typically, I would do like on Sunday, I would do a revamp of all our stuff. So I would go back and check, did we finish any books? Those go back on the regular shelves. I would pull the next week's books out. I would file away any papers. The um, instructor's guide pages would go back into the blue binder and I would pull out the pages for the following week. If there was something that we didn't finish, that stayed on top. Like let's say we didn't finish the history reading for that week those pages would stay on top. And that's what we would work on first. We would tackle that and get that done so that I could put it away and then we could move on to the following week. So the, the dresser with one drawer per child, that's where all their papers went. So at the beginning of the week, when I would give them their language arts activity sheet or their science activity sheet, they would have a little folder, like it just the kind that would just open up with the two pockets and they would keep their papers in there. And then that folder would go in their drawer. And that way they didn't lose it. They didn't get wrinkly. It, you know, it had a place. And then the next day when they needed to work on some more questions on the science activity sheet, it was all inside that folder and things did not get lost. So having a place to put all their things helped to keep the house tidy and neat. They had to learn though, that they had to put their things away, but they they did. The other thing that I love to do is to label my books. I like to label them by what level they are. So level K and um, what it is. So if it's a history book or a read aloud or a science book or a reader or whatever. So um, level K, history, level K, read aloud, language arts, whatever it is. And I started, when I first started, I used the um, Sunlight Has Colored sticker pieces that can go on your, on your um, spine, your book spine. But if in case uh, you, ha you have to handwrite on that. Sometimes I get a little bit um, picky and I wanted to type it because it was neater. Um, it was legible and I could get it to all fit. So I moved to using the 30 uh, labels per page address, return address labels. And, um, and that way I can, for each level, I could count how many history books there are and I could do level K history, level K history, level K history, and label my books that way. Why do you label your books? Well, when you've been homeschooling for a while and you have multiple levels and kids love to read, they're gonna pull books off the shelves that you're not currently using in your current year. And then you're not gonna know what level does it go to? Where does this go back? So if you know that this is a level K book history, then you know exactly what the address is where that book lives and you can put it back. 
So it just simplifies um, your life. Another thing you could do is if you don't have a shelf or drawer, you could do cubbies, you could do baskets, you could do um, those pull behind things on wheels, you know, they're square milk crate kind of things. Um, the important thing is just having a dedicated space so that kids know where they go, they can put it away and your house stays neat. And then I alluded to having a, um, a one hour of time where at the end of the week, some people do it on Friday. I was usually ready for a break, so I would do it on Sunday. Um, it takes, I say an hour, it often took less than an hour, but you know, carve out an hour's worth of time where you can do a reboot. You can go through the completed papers and file those away. You can put away your instructor's guide pages. You can uh, pull out the new ones, put away books, pull out books. Um, any of those loose things you can do at, at that end of the week to set you up well for the following week. So that way, when Monday comes around, you're ready to go. Uh, what to do with all the paper. So Sunlight is not a workbook driven or a worksheet driven curriculum, and I love that, but there are still papers that will come up. There are language arts activity sheets, there are science activity sheets, there are writing assignments. Um, you might do some of the optional workbooks, so you will have some paper. And I have done some different things over the years. One of the things, I had a large filing cabinet where we filed our home papers, and I got the idea to file, uh, to get a hanging file folder, one per child, and then in the hanging folder, put uh, manila folders, one for each subject that had papers. So language arts, science, math, whatever. And whatever pages you wanted to keep, you could then file in those folders and keep it, them in order that way. It, it just, if you do a little bit every week, then it doesn't get crazy. I did that for a while and then I decided um, that I think I needed the space. Like I, my, um, my filing cabinet starting, was starting to fill up with my own papers. And so I needed the space. And so then I switched to a notebook. So I would buy a two inch binder and put dividers in them. And then for each tab, each tab would be a subject and you could file your papers behind that tab. Uh, depending on what state you're in and what the requirements are, our state where I live, I live in Florida, our state required um, that you save some papers, but not every single paper, things that show the progression of um, achievement. So at the beginning, a few in the middle, and then toward the end. So you, so you could show the progress that was made over the year. So I start by saving everything. And then every quarter or so, about every nine weeks, give or take, depending on what, you know, if it was Christmas time, it might get pushed back. But I would go through those papers and decide which of those I wanted to keep. I didn't keep everything. I, I would start by keeping everything. And then I would then as the year went on. And so that by the end of the year, I have a notebook that is representative of the work that my kids have done. But it's not every single paper. You just don't need to keep every single paper. So if you do a weekly file things away and then a quarterly thin through things, then by the end of the year, you're, you're in good shape. Another thing you could do, and this was not really an option when I started homeschooling, but you could digitize things. There are apps now that make this so much easier. Back in my day, I would have had to scan everything and that was just too, too time consuming and who had time for that? But if you wanted to further reduce the clutter, you could scan the papers and keep a digital folder. Again, if your state allows it. So that is how you can organize books and papers to keep your homeschool and your house in good shape. In addition to that, I would suggest that you introduce daily rest habits. 
you want to create li lifelong habits in your children. And I'm saying this from experience. Some things I have done well, some things I have not done so well, and I regret. So take it from me, the voice of experience. This is something you want to invest in. So the first thing is to establish a post subject stop. So after you finish working on a particular subject, say you're having some table time and everyone is working on math, don't move on to the next subject without putting away the books and materials from that subject. So if you're done with math, put your math workbook away, put your ruler, your pencil, eraser, whatever it is that you were using to do your math back away and then you can get out the next subjects, um, books and materials. So that's just cleaning as you go. I, I like to do that in the kitchen as well. So when you clean as you go, then at the end of the day, it keeps the mess under control. Also, you can assign a cruise through the house at some point during the day. Maybe it's right before lunch, while you go fix lunch, the kids do this. And then at the end of the school day before they're released to go play. So you want to do just a cruise through. Um, I, again, I love my laundry baskets. I use them for so many things. You can assign each child a laundry basket. I actually had um, dish pans with each child's name. And I would tell them, run around with your dish pan and pick up things that belong to you and then go put them away. And even if they didn't pick up every single thing that was out, at least it helped to reduce the things that were out by somewhat, even if it wasn't every single thing. Um, we would often do, uh, I learned this from the fly lady, we would often do when I couldn't handle it anymore, a five minute room rescue. So I would take the kitchen timer and set it to five minutes. Sometimes we'd play some fun music and um, run around the room and pick things up, me included, like everyone, all hands on deck. Everybody had to participate in that when things were getting out of control. And maybe it was like, you know, the throw blankets needed to be folded up and put back in the basket. The shoes that got kicked off need to be put away. Um, toys that had been played with during read aloud time didn't get put back on the shelf. So all those kinds of things. If you participate in the room rescue yourself, you can make sure kids are on task. It's only five minutes. Um, you are in control as to what's going on. And plus you're modeling how to do it when you are doing it as well. So this is an idea I got from a friend. I was not really good with this. I'm a little bit of a control freak, so I preferred to do things myself, but I regret it because as the kids got older, then they were not expected to do it when they were younger. So then they did not think that they had to, to do things when they were older. And that is to help in the kitchen. You can assign a kitchen super, like the person who's in charge of the kitchen, um, so you have a kitchen super for the day and it can rotate or you could do week, you know, one person per week. Uh, but just that person is in charge of loading the dirty dishes, wiping the counters or the the um, the table, um, putting away foodstuffs that might be have been left out. So the sandwich stuff that was taken out to make sandwiches. My sister-in-law is a she has this down to a science. The kids, she she never cleans the kitchen. Her kids are in charge of that. So much so that they even got rid of their dishwasher because the kids wash all the dishes by hand and put everything away. So she has it dialed in. She's a superstar. And I did not do that. So take it from me. When you have adult children who move back into the house and they're not used to doing it, um, then you we're having to do a little bit of retraining. It's okay. But if you do it when they're young, they will, it will help you out. And, um, and er, you know, everybody is living in the house, everyone eats. So it's only fair that everyone participates in picking up, putting things away and cleaning. The other thing that I did not do is to teach your children laundry skills early. Again, I did not do this because I did not want 
with three kids, I did not want each child doing multiple loads of their own clothes because that adds up to a lot of separate loads of laundry, a lot of soap, a lot of water, a lot of electricity, and sometimes mess, you know, they mess up and wash something red with their whites and then everything is pink. So I did not, I was not very good at this. I like, I still to this day like to be the one to do the laundry. But if you have a large family and if you are not in love with doing laundry, then this might be a really good idea for you. So in some families, each child gets assigned a day. So Monday is Thomas's day and Tuesday is Timothy's day and Wednesday is Annie's day. And that is the day that they have access to the washer. So they learn that if they don't do it on their day, then when Friday comes around, they may not have their soccer uniform that they need. So it helps them to build routine. It helps them to build responsibility. It's a really good idea. I just didn't do it. Um, what I did do was I would help, I, I would make my kids help me fold and they had to put away. And we would often do it with an audiobook, whether it was a school book or just a for fun book. We'd put an audiobook on and the kids would, we, we would all fold and make piles and then we would pause and the kids would all go run and put their things away and then come back and do the next load. Um, so, just some tips and tricks, but it will teach them skills that will last them a lifetime. Remember that creating a restful home and homeschool environment is a collaborative effort. It's a team effort. It is not your job only to keep up with everything in the house. Each member of the household can contribute. That They are living there as well, and they are using all of the food and the clothes and all the things so they can help to maintain the house. Um, I loved to schedule regular decluttering times uh, before birthdays and before Christmas is a great time to go through the children's rooms and um, closets whenever we would do a, um, a seasonal change when summer or winter. That was a great time to pack away things for younger children, like to go through and say, okay, yes, uh, next year, Timothy will be able to fit into these jeans. I'll save them. Or, okay, these jeans are done. They have holes everywhere. So we're going to get rid of these. Um, or uh, I don't like the way this shirt fits. And so it's going to disappear. So if you schedule regular decluttering times throughout the year, then when there is an influx of new things, like at Christmas and birthdays, then you will have space to put things away. You will have room for them. If you invest the time, you will reap. Remember what you reap, what you sow. So you have to sow the time to get things under control so that you can reap the benefits of having a calm, um, less cluttered house. The last tip I'm gonna share is what do you do when you have more books than you have bookshelf space? So if you don't have um, a big enough house to have six bookcases so you can house all of your sunlight materials, uh, one thing I do is I would regularly declutter optional books, so books that was not curriculum. If, if the kids were too big, board books, you know, they had outgrown board books, I would only save a few of my favorites, because one day I'm gonna have grandkids, I hope. Um, but then I would pass those on. So I would thin out the books that, um, that were not part of the curriculum. And if when we got to the place where we didn't even have uh, shelf space for curriculum books, then I would pack them away in um, plastic bins and store them in the house. Um, I found space under my son's bed. He has a kind of a higher antique bed. And so it would fit underneath that bed. And uh, I, like I said, I live in Florida. We don't have basements. We have attics, but the attics get really, really hot. And uh, I don't store books in the attic because I think that the binding would melt. 
Um, I also don't store books in the garage because it's not temperature controlled and um, the, it's very humid in Florida. So the humidity would ruin books. So if you live in a part of the country where you um, can store things and it's not humid, then obviously putting them in bins and storing them in places like that is ideal. But if not, then see if you can find a corner of the house, whether it's a hallway closet, um, under the bed, a spare room. Maybe you can put it in a guest room or an office space, um, whatever you can do. But, but just keep the books that you're going to be using currently. Um, maybe one or two levels. If you have multiple kids, you may be doing multiple levels of history, Bible, literature, or you may want to keep a level or two out that the kids could read from. Kids love to reread the books that they love, so you may want to keep out um, books that they're going to read, but maybe not, you know, a math book that you're not going to use this year. So those are my tips and tricks. And the last thing I, I do want to say is that everything has a season and you are in a very, very particular season right now, but it won't last forever. I promise I am on the other side. Um, my bookshelves have decreased significantly. I, I'm a book lover, but I am at the age where I'm letting things go more and more. And that includes books. So this is just a season. I promise you there will be a day where you won't have as much clutter as many books and, and it'll be a bittersweet time. So thank you for joining me today. I wish you well.